Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. It's even a greater pleasure to be here to talk about something that I'm passionate about, and that's startup companies. It's very good to start the whole day with startups, right? Uh, and it's even more interesting to see that there are people like us, the three of us sitting together, and a lot more people in the audience, that are those that really do start something from the beginning. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for the last 16 years. That is not something that I planned. I'm an electrical engineer by training with an MBA in international management. And back in the 70s when I graduated, there were about 10 of us in a class of 2000. When I started working at Honeywell, I was the only female engineer for about 10 years until another person showed up. So it is a great pleasure to see so many more people interested in STEM being here and looking forward to participating in the energy revolution. Um, I started my third company last year to develop 1,000 uh, megawatts of, of floating offshore wind off the coast of California. Because California has committed to 50% renewables by the year 2030, and it will require a lot of energy. However, to get a company going, there are a lot of challenges that we need to overcome. Number one, financial. You already heard at least three times here today in the morning, people are looking for money. Without money, you cannot really make things happen. Other challenges that we're going to discuss today include how do you get technology from an idea to reality? How do you get the technology that has been demonstrated to become commercially viable? All those things are very big challenges that we need to discuss. Here today, we have two, pa two panelists. Shazia Khan, who is with uh, Eco Energy Finance, that's connecting off-grid Pakistanis to electricity, and Atosha Cave with Opus 12 that converts um, or looks for CO2 reduction in biofuels. I'll let each of them to describe their careers, and maybe each of you can talk about how you got to where you are. Did you plan to be an entrepreneur, or did it just kind of happen? Talk about your path. So maybe we can start with you. Um, yeah, so I, I am a co-founder of Opus 12, where we take carbon dioxide, water, and electricity, and we convert it into chemicals and fuels. And we do that by using metal catalysts and electricity to break down the CO2 and water into smaller bits and pieces, and then reform them into new molecules. And these molecules include things like diesel fuel and uh, plastics and things like that that we use uh, commonly today. And my journey uh, to entrepreneurship started right here at Stanford, so I did my PhD work here, and uh, me and the other technical co-founder, Kendra Cool, we did our PhD together in the lab and in the chemical engineering department. And about two and a half years ago, um, we, you know, we're toward the end of our, our term here, and we're really excited about the products we were working on, and really love the technology, and really passionate about it. And so we wanted to continue the work, and we, we, we thought the technology was ready for, um, industry scale up. And so uh, we started uh, to build a company um, and we, we found a, um, a, a student who was doing an MBA as well as a Master's of Engineering and we, we joined forces and, and we started Opus 12 um, um, out of the lab here at, at Stanford. So. Okay. Um, thank you, Ala, and thank you all for being here and um, really for this opportunity. I'm gonna start with my journey. I can trace it back to one very distinct moment. When I was a little girl, I had this very peculiar habit. I used to steal gold chains out of my mother's jewelry box, and I used to spend hours and hours tangling them up into these knots. The more intractable the knot, the better. And then I would derive great pleasure um, from untangling them. Just I would try to make the worst knot that I could and then just spend hours and hours and hours untangling them. And I can still remember that sweet spot, that moment where I was like, oh, I have this puzzle. All the threads become clear and they all they all just start to unravel and everything falls into place. And I think that as an entrepreneur, this is something that you really have to love. You have to love problem solving. You have to be able to look at a challenge, see it as a problem, um, and then appreciate it for its complexity and really love the process of solving the problem. Because as an entrepreneur, you find yourself solving the same challenges again, or again, again and again. You create um, a model, you have one iteration, and then each time you have a new development, you solve one set of problems, there's a whole another set of variables that you have to solve. So you have to really enjoy that process, I think, as an entrepreneur. 
For the last 10 years, I've been working on one very big knot, one very big intractable problem, and that is the energy crisis in Pakistan. Uh, it's a really, really interesting problem. For me, um, my family is Pakistani American. I was born and raised in the US in upstate New York. Um, I was very interested in finding out what the roots of poverty were and uh, figuring out how to work towards a solution for poverty alleviation in Pakistan. And I found that poverty is inextricably linked with lack of access to energy, um, to electricity, uh, certainly in Pakistan, but in, in many different developing countries. And so um, I, went to, uh, I went to law school and I studied environmental law with a concentration on energy issues. Um, I, after law school, I ended up working for the World Bank, first as an intern and then as a consultant. But I left there because I wanted to do something a lot more hands-on and really um, dig deep in, in, into the heart of this problem. So in 2009, I created a company called Eco Energy Finance. And when I first launched it, it was just a traditional nonprofit. I was figuring out how can I bring solar energy solutions and distribute them um, to places in rural Pakistan. But once I got there, I realized that there was actually hundreds of thousands of people where I only had a couple of thousands of solutions. So um, I, I came back and I went to Wharton and I enlisted the help of a group of people from Wharton who could help me turn this into a social enterprise. And it's been mentioned that one of the only ways to solve these problems is to figure out a way to make it profitable and to make it financially sustainable. And so that's what I was looking to do. So um, in 2011, I turned my company into a, a true company, into a social enterprise. And we began distributing solar, uh, solar home systems, solar lanterns, and we pioneered pay-as-you-go solar in Pakistan. Um, I know Anya just talked about that a couple of minutes ago. Um, I have a co-founder, his name's Jeremy Higgs, he's an Australian that's been living in Karachi for the last eight years and uh, together we have built um, a sales distribution network that um, has powered over 12,000 homes and uh, that's where we sit today. Wonderful. So um, Itasha, since your company developed technology, maybe you can talk a little bit about the path that you took to develop your technology, the funding, how did you raise the money, and what would it take and how long would it take for the technology to become a product, to become commercially viable, available, and cost-effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, because when, when we were here at Stanford, I mean, the, our PhD work was pretty much orthogonal to kind of what we do now in terms of developing the country, I mean, developing the company. Um, um, you know, our work here was basic science, was on the basic science side, and our company is, is actually building this reactor. And so we basically started out with a set of ideas, and um, that's a very risky place to be if you're developing technology, because there's technology risk in that there's a chance that your ideas won't work. And so it was very tough getting traditional VC funding. Um, you know, people told us, well, as soon as you build a prototype that's working, we'll fund you. But we couldn't afford to build a prototype. We, we were just grad students and didn't have any disposable income to kind of uh, build a lab and like have this prototype working. And it's not something you can do in your garage. Um, so we, um, we basically set out to build an ecosystem around us that would provide the funding and the mentorship and, and uh, things like that to get us going. And so we found that through, um, through the Tomcat Center here at Stanford. We um, got a grant through them that helped us build that first prototype. Uh, we also uh, got into Stardex, and we're also in an in a incubator at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called uh, Cyclotron Road. And um, you know, this, is, this has created this ecosystem around us that allowed us to um, use resources to build our prototype much, much cheaper and sort of a lean startup uh, way, which has been phenomenal because um, otherwise, you know, who knows what would have happened in terms of us being able to, to develop this, this company. So if there's any uh, one bit of advice I would give for building a clean tech startup is make sure you create this ecosystem around you through uh, incubators and accelerators and mentors and, um, and, and funding sources as well. Um, and since we've, we've been in Cyclotron Road, we have developed a prototype, and, and now that we have data and we know that our ideas work, um, we're uh, scaling them up, and we're using um, uh, both 
private money through angel investors, as well as government grants. So there's um, small, small business innovation research grants that are out there that have been a uh, tremendous help for us because we basically write up our proposal and uh, we show data that shows that these, these ideas can work and we've been given you know, small amounts of money to do feasibility studies and then once we can show that it is feasible, we'll get a larger sum of money to actually develop the technology. And um, once we you know, can, can develop our sort of larger scale prototype, then we'll be very attractive for VCs who uh, will come in later and can support us um, as we continue to scale up and grow into a large company. Um, and, and in terms of developing technology, it, it does take quite some time. I mean, you, you, you know, um, every step of the way, you kind of have to show that your technology works. Um, you, you can't release sort of a product that has a lot of bugs in it because no one, you know, a, comp a, a customer that's buying your product is investing a lot of money in this and they, they're relying on it. They're, you know, it's an energy system or it's, it's a, something that they rely on. So to, um, you have to have it right the first time. And so that takes time and it takes funding uh, and takes uh, setting goals and really being deliberate and making sure you can reach your performance points and knowing the economics of your system. And so we've been doing all of that and, and we're still pretty early. You know, we, um, we're working and, and we're getting really good progress, but there's still um, much many more miles to go before we good. have a product. Shazia. Your company has a service. It's not really a product per se, it's a service. So how do you see that service to be able to scale such that it can broaden uh, its population base and be reachable by many more people? And what would you need to be able to do that? Um, well, funding, as you've mentioned, is, is definitely critical. We've done We've done pretty well. We've done the best that we could. We've raised almost $500,000 just through um, grants, debt, supplier credit. Um, for us, it is a service that we're providing. We're providing something that's the equivalent of the utility service that you all, that we all have here. We pay for access to reliable electricity, and that's the same thing in, in um, off-grid Pakistan. There are 70 million people there that want access to reliable electricity. And th the biggest challenge that we've had is working in a country where the government has no interest in providing access to, you know, to energy for these people. They're very focused on increasing capacity for the national grid, but 40% of the population lives in these rural areas and the government has no interest or no plan to get them connected or get them electrified. So there was definitely a market opportunity there. For us, it was really just about increasing energy access, but there is a market there. We have a 93% repayment rate amongst our customers. We go, we connect them. Um, we did extensive market research. We had to get, a, we, we got a, a great deal of grant money just to do the market research because the data in Pakistan was very scarce. So I would say that we spent three or four years just going and trying to understand what the true energy picture in Pakistan was. I think that market research is really critical. Um, we visited 44,000 households, 2,200 villages, just collecting data, figuring out what energy consumption patterns were, what people were spending, what their livelihoods were, what percentage of their income they were spending. Um, and then we wanted to provide them with a drop-in solution uh, that was affordable to them um, and that was comparable to what they were already paying or less. And so now we go, we connect people, they pay through, um, through a mobile money agent. It's basically they're prepaying they're the same way that they go and they top off on their cell phones, they're prepaying um, a credit. We can unlock it remotely and then that unlocks a corresponding amount of energy to them every single month. I think that it's gonna take off in the same way that cell phones have taken off. A lot of times um, when I get pushback, it's that, oh well, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have these decentralized solar solutions. Instead, you should be working on expanding the national grid, which is very expensive and doesn't make any sense or building microgrids. Well, that doesn't actually make any sense either because that's very expensive and that's generating more electricity than these people actually have the need for. They want to light some fans, some light bulbs, charge their phones. They want to power a TV. They want to connect to the internet. Um, they don't need to be paying for the infrastructure that a microgrid or that expanding the national grid needs. They, they, want, they need something the equivalent of a cell phone. To me, it's like if somebody were to say, well, we really need to still go and build power lines for phones because that's how people do it. Why? There's 180 million people in Pakistan, 130 million of them have cell phones. Why wouldn't they, if they can use that cell phone to pay for their electricity, 
And why, if they're already used to paying for something that's in their hand that they can carry around with them, why wouldn't they want the same thing for their energy? So I think it's um, really just uh, a matter of time before, before uh, decentralized solar solutions become the solution in the same way that cell phones have in developing countries. So if you look back and you try to identify three things, events, something, that made you um, come to where you are besides the mother's drawer <laughs> chains that you were solving as, as a puzzle. But there are other things. What are the three things that made you who you are, got your company to where it is, and would allow you to succeed in the future? Well, I would say for me, um, in, in growing up in, in Houston, Texas, I, was a, um, I grew up adjacent to a neighborhood that was affected adversely by an oil and gas waste site. And kind of hearing about this class action lawsuit that was happening really um, kind of affected me and, and, and set me on the path toward uh, finding uh, cleaner energy and, and, and more environmental solutions for um, our energy and chemical needs. Um, so I would say that was probably like the, the first uh, big spark that kind of um, put me on this path. Um, secondly, I would say just having a lot of strong mentors um, along the way. Um, there are several uh, men and women who um, have really provided great advice and great um, mentorship, not only just for me, but also for our, our company now and our team. Again, through these ecosystems, you know, the, the StartX and the Cyclotron Row and Tomcat Center have been really great um, in terms of encouraging us. And, and um, you know, there were some times when we thought, oh, maybe we're not quite ready. And, and you know, someone said, no, just go do it. And, and we did it. And, and, and that has been um, super helpful in terms of uh, building momentum and, and getting uh, forward traction. Um, and I guess third, I would say um, getting a good team together. So, um, so I mentioned earlier, Kendra and I, um, we did our PhD together. So I, I know a lot about Kendra more than I probably would ever want to know because we've worked together for so long. And so that's been really great to have that um, really strong, not only, not only are we you know, good coworkers, but we also um, really understand each other and really uh, work well together. Um, and then we've built a team that's just phenomenal. We've been lucky in having and attracting really top scientists and, and um, who also work well as a team. And so that's been, it's been huge. It's not only just, um, it's great to go to work for the sense of purpose, but also just, it's really fun just to be around this team. So I think that, that helps get us through the tough times. Great, Shazia. Um, three things that I think, um, well, I think first that I'm very American. I was born and raised here. I would say that my values are very American. My confidence, my you know, bravado is very American. But some of the things that really helped to define and to shape who I am are visits that I had as a child to Pakistan. Uh, I used to go to Pakistan regularly, age four, age six, age eight, eight ten, age 10, 12. Every two years I used to visit. And those, I have very vivid memories that, I don't want to say haunt me, but really left an impression on me coming from America. I, I remember um, there was no light, no hot water, no fans. It was really hot there. Um, I remember just seeing so much poverty. And it was uh, really difficult as a child to see just so much poverty and go from feeling this sense of hopelessness to anger to well, why can't I be part of the solution? So I think that if you see anything that um, angers you, that that can, on the flip side, be something to motivate you to be part of the solution or the change. Um, I remember seeing kids younger than me and my brother, age four, selling chiclets on the side of the road, selling fresh coconut, no shoes, nothing. I mean, I, I will never be able to erase those memories. But now every time I go back to Pakistan, I feel more and more um, empowered. I see different things. I see more positive things. I see how I can, I'm effectuating change. The women that we're working with, um, we're giving them hope. We're giving them opportunities to make a living. Uh, that's something that definitely shaped me. Um, I would echo Itasha's sentiment. Having a good team is really critical. Um, I knew this is something that I wanted to do, but I would say that we, this company was really reborn in 2011 when I took on a partner, Jeremy Higgs. Uh, I, I think that it's really important to have um, a partner that, that balances you out. You both need to understand very well your own weaknesses, your own strengths, and then gravitate towards somebody that can 
um, supplement, you know, where, wherever you have deficiencies. And third, uh, I mean, in terms of the company, it's really important that market research was really important. Um, financial sustainability and whatever you do, it's really critical that from the outset, you look at a way to make it financially sustainable and scalable. Um, I worked really hard to grow the network that I needed to give me the funding that I needed, and then um, and then just put yourself out there. We I really we we applied to um, for a lot of grant opportunities that I didn't think that we would get, and we did. We won National Geographic's Great Energy Challenge. We got a lot of support from the UK government. We've gotten great support from the U.S. from the Department of State. Um, We've been in talks with USAID for a long time, so there is support out there. You just have to be willing to go out and, and get it. So as we come to the conclusion of the panel, if you project yourself to 2050 and you try to imagine that your product, your service, is now in mainstream, how would you see it? Shall we start with you? Yeah. Well, um, well okay, there's two things I would say about uh, 2050 and my, my product. So. Uh, so one, um, our use of carbon extends much beyond just fuels and energy. I mean, we use carbon to make plastics, to make household products. I mean, um, you know, if, if in 2050, let's say the, you know, the grid were all renewables or fusion came online, you know, we would still need carbon products. And so um, my company, my technology really sees ourselves as, as like transforming the way we make uh, compounds and chemicals and products and that we, we're starting from the ground up, we're taking these fundamental building blocks of CO2 and water, and we're just making new products from that, the same products that we currently already use. So um, I can see us literally making plastics from CO2 that would have been in the air and, um, and providing this sort of um, recycling and, and, and industrial CO2 cycle that, that we would create. Another really exciting um, avenue for my technology in 2050 is that uh, so the, uh, the Martian atmosphere is 95% CO2. Um, so, you know, SpaceX and NASA have announced that they, are, they have plans to go to Mars, and our technology can be right there making fuels and chemicals and products and things that the astronauts there would, would need to survive. And so that's really exciting to think that, you know, if we as a, a, a planet decide to go beyond Earth and go into this to space that um, our, our little module can be right there making, um, making some of the most fundamental products that you would need to survive in space. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, Shazia? Yeah. Um, I, I see that there's 1.2 billion people in this world that don't have access to electricity in the developing world, and um, the technology is already here. Uh, so I see it by 2050 that this will become ubiquitous as a solution. There's um, several uh, companies around the world that are doing something similar to what we're doing. So the technology is really only one aspect of it. The difficulty is how do you get a technology from um, a design lab or from a warehouse and bring it into the hands of people. And I think that uh, what's going to be critical for, um, for us to reach this critical mass or to reach this tipping point where everybody has access to basic energy services, probably through solar um, in the developing world, is going to be when you get companies that leverage local expertise that you need in order to create the distribution networks um, to get it into the hands of people. So uh, there's been widespread success in East Africa, um, MCOPA, Off-Grid Electric, there's been many, there's some in India. Um, for Pakistan, we don't have the same networks or the same platforms available, so we have to do something different. Nepal doesn't have the same platforms available, so you have to really have a local, you really need to engage local expertise and figure out a way to um, make distribution happen. So thank you very much, ladies. I guess to summarize, startup is possible, funding is necessary, make your dreams happen, and look out to the future, because if you can project your product, service, or whatever to be available 10, 15 years from now, you'll make it happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, ladies.